Hi, I'm Buma Arabamuddin, and I'll be talking to you today about our work characterizing the gait features of dystonia and cerebral palsy. So CP, or cerebral palsy, is a lifelong movement disorder that's characterized by a disturbance in the developing brain that leads to a persistent non-progressive motor disability. And dystonia in CP literally means abnormal tone and is formally defined as voluntary movement triggered overflow muscle activation. And what that means is that when you try to move the wrong muscles, so the muscles that you don't want to contract, contract, and they do so out of your control. And you can imagine that the functional impact of this can be quite high. And dystonia is, in addition, also quite painful. And although about 15% of people with CP are thought to have dystonia as their predominant form of tone, up to 75% of people with CP are thought to have at least some component of dystonia. So addressing the problems in dystonia care can have broad reaching impact. And one of these problems is that dystonia is hard to diagnose. And without diagnosing dystonia, you can't institute dystonia specific treatments. And that's a particular problem for dystonia because some treatments like deep brain stimulation, we know work best if they're started early. So any sort of delay in diagnosis can have functional impacts. The current gold standard for dystonia diagnosis is expert consensus. And what that means is that a group of experts um, in dystonia will evaluate a person moving either um, directly or by video, have a discussion about them, and then out comes a diagnosis. Either they say this person has dystonia or this person does not have dystonia. But the question remains, what are the specific movement features that a person might display that might prompt an expert to diagnose dystonia? So there are some validated tools and scales that have attempted to make this process a little bit easier. But those tools and scales focus on the triggers for dystonia. So if you touch someone or if someone tries to move, they end up having an abnormal movement that's involuntary, and that movement is dystonia. But the specific movement features that prompt experts to diagnose dystonia have not been formally codified. So the purpose of our paper was to focus on this gold standard, was to codify expert consensus and describe it in a way that practitioners who may not have access to that expert consensus could then apply the same sorts of standards to diagnose dystonia in clinical practice. What we did was we had three movement disorders experts with specific expertise in cerebral palsy look at 40 videos of people who were walking who had CP, spasticity, and a type of brain injury called periventricular leukomalacia. All of these people had had a diagnosis of CP. Of these 40 videos, before these experts had consensus building discussion about whether or not there was dystonia in the video, only 30% of videos had experts reaching consensus, meaning that before they discussed it, in only 30% of videos did experts agree about the presence or absence of dystonia. After discussion, uh, experts agreed on 85% of videos, meaning that consensus building discussion had real value in helping experts decide whether dystonia was present or not. But highlighting the difficulty of dystonia diagnosis is that in still six out of the 40 videos, experts didn't reach consensus. And this highlights how difficult it can be to diagnose dystonia with just a small video snippet in one setting alone. What we next did was use qualitative thematic analysis to analyze their consensus building discussion. And we broke that discussion down into codes, meaning that each idea that recurred in a discussion, we gave a code title to, and then looked at the frequency distribution of those codes throughout the discussion. We saw a natural inflection point after the first seven codes. And these seven codes broke down as follows. Um, and they really seemed to aggregate into two themes. One was that dystonia is difficult to diagnose, and we all know that. 
But the other theme really highlighted key features specific to movement that might have triggered an expert to diagnose dystonia. And if we look at those features, theme one, the difficulty of dystonia diagnosis, you can see that there was no real difference between videos where the experts ultimately diagnosed dystonia and videos where the experts ultimately did not diagnose dystonia. They um, commonly cited that dystonia was difficult to diagnose regardless of the ultimate diagnosis. But when we look at the videos again and we look at theme two, so that's variable unilateral adduction of the leg or foot, you see that it was much more common, significantly more common, for experts to cite that theme in their discussion when they were diagnosing dystonia in a video. So when they saw dystonia, they were more likely to say that they saw this theme or more likely to cite this theme than they were when they said they did not see dystonia. You can see an example of some of these expert cited features in this video of a child with CP and dystonia. So with this data taken together, we can see that we can in fact codify gold standard diagnosis, expert consensus. And we can do this for a specific movement pattern in a specific group of people with cerebral palsy. What we hope to do is to take techniques like this and characterize people with cerebral palsy of different causes, with different motor issues, and also look at different voluntary movement patterns in people with CP. If you have any questions or would like to reach out, please feel free to reach out to me by email or by Twitter. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you.